Hey there, welcome to today's lesson on accuracy and precision. Today we are going to determine how good, how valid, how precise, how reliable our measurements are in a lab setting. So question of the day, pause to answer. Aside from asking your teacher or your classmate, how do you know if your lab experiment went well? Okay, some answers I have are compare to known scientific data. So you can look up what the answer should be in a book or using the internet or a reference table. And there are some mathematical checks that we can use to make sure that our answers are correct and how far they are from those reference materials. And that is what we are going to be working with today. So to begin, what does it mean to be accurate? Accurate in a science setting indicates how close you are to the true or the accepted value. So in science, the accepted value is going to be the one that is considered scientific fact. If you were to look it up on a reference table in the glossary or one of the appendices, appendixes of a textbook, if you were to look it up, um, like online on the Wikipedia page for a chemical, that is going to be considered the accepted value. So for water, the freezing point and melting point is zero degrees Celsius. Its boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius when you're at standard pressure. Um, that can change. Um, those are going to be considered the accepted values or, you know, the scientific fact. I put fact in parentheses, in um, air quotes, because facts... I don't want to say that they change, but they are kind of up for debate. We use, we didn't, for a long time, humans didn't know that germs existed. We thought that you got sick if you like were a bad person. If you called somebody a name, you would catch a cold. If you um, stole from somebody, you'd get the flu and you'd be sick for a week. We used to think that's how you got sick. Now we know that you get sick from germs. Um, we used to think that the earth was in the middle of the universe and the sun went around us. And now we know it's the opposite. The sun's in the middle and the earth goes around. Facts don't necessarily change. Facts are facts. Our understanding of them change. So, um, even just like the masses of the elements, I have a pocket periodic table. Um, these masses change every once in a while. And that's just because we collect more data and we can get a better picture of what the truth really is. So um, it's not that the facts change. It's that what we decide is the accepted value can change. And that's largely based on accepting more data. Now, precision or being precise is more related to your work as a scientist on the experiment. And when you do an experiment multiple times, which you should to make sure that um, your results aren't a fluke or something strange that's happening, um, your precision is how close your measurements are to each other. So if you, um, let's just think of a thermometer. If you are boiling a pot of water, and you're at standard pressure, standard atmospheric pressure, um, the water should be boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. So if you have a few pots of water boiling all at once, um, and your thermometer is going to say 99.7, 99.9, 100 even, 100.2, your precision is how close all of those measurements are to each other. And if all of those measurements are really close, then you know that the things that you are doing are very reproducible, meaning that when you did the first trial, and you got your result. If your second result is very close to your first result, it means that the written lab procedure that you followed, step one, step two, step three, that means that it's written very well because you're able to do the same thing almost exactly over and over again. And that's great to have high precision when all of your answers are really close together. Um, it means that you, the scientist, are following the directions really, really well, and the directions are very well written. Now, we spoke about the accepted value a little bit. That is what we consider scientific fact. And of course, that can change, but it's rare that it changes. And if it does change, it's only changing a teeny tiny bit at this point. Um, most of our giant scientific changes are happening um, 
once every few years, like Pluto being demoted, that was a change in scientific fact. We used to think that Pluto was one of the planets in our solar system, and now we're more so thinking it's an exoplanet. Um, and that's just a change in the scientific fact. Now, I'm going to give you some targets where we are going to talk about low accuracy, low precision, high accuracy, high precision, and we're going to mix and match those. So I, if I were you, I would pause this and kind of estimate what you think a bullseye or target would look like if we had low accuracy and low precision. The center, the bullseye, is the correct answer that we're trying to get to. All right, low accuracy and low precision would look something like this with your answers all over the place. So clearly the directions that we're following are not great because our results are all over the place. And because they're not well written, the results that we're getting are not close to the scientific truth. All right, what about high accuracy and low precision? Okay, here we would have all of our answers pretty close to the correct answer, but they're not close to each other. They're kind of spread out. And what about low accuracy and high precision? These answers are gonna be really close together, but not necessarily close to the target. And this here is maybe the toughest one to overcome. And that is because you are following the directions super, super well but the directions are not pointing you towards the correct answer. So that means you have to go and rewrite your entire experimental procedure because it's not bringing you to the right answer. And this one's super, super frustrating because you're like, I'm doing it right, I'm doing it right, but you're not getting the answer you want. And that really, really stinks. All right, last up, we have high accuracy and high precision. And this is how you would want all of your experimental results to turn out. Those are going to be really close to the target and really close to each other. And this indicates that your procedure and your methods are, are fantastic. You're doing a great job. So to recap, if you have high accuracy, it means that your procedure is a procedure that is pointing you in the right direction. You're taking the correct steps to get you to the correct answer. What you are doing is going to more or less mimic what other scientists have done. And high precision really comes down to what we would call your bench work. So if you're in the lab, at the lab counter, which we call the lab bench, um, I don't know why we call it a bench, we just do. Whatever stuff you're mixing and measuring and your tools, those are all going to be things that are really great and reliable. So your precision kind of comes down to like your skills with your hands as a scientist. We can take a mathematical measurement of how close your data is to the correct scientific accepted value answer. And to do that, we would use what's called the percent error equation. And this is gonna tell us if our experiment is considered valid. Um, so the percent error equation is equal to the measured value, so the number that you come up with, minus the accepted value, the one that you would look up in a reference table that all the scientists agree with. And you're going to take the absolute value of that. That's what those vertical bars mean. Um, the absolute value just means if you get a negative, turn it into a positive. And if it's a positive, leave it alone. You are going to take that and divide it by the accepted value that all of the scientists agree with. You multiply it by 100 to turn that into a percent, and then you would have your percent error. Typically, we like our results to be within 5% to consider a, an experiment's results accurate. If your results are really, really off, it doesn't mean that you're a bad scientist. In fact, most of science is getting things wrong. Uh, as long as you can understand and articulate why your results are not accurate, you're doing everything fine. Um, also, your, your bad results may just be the... Um, the victim of bad science equipment. Um, there is a lab that's really well known, it's the calorimetry, and that is measuring heat flow. When you do calorimetry in a high school science setting, a lot of the time they do it with like styrofoam cups. It's, it's pretty good, but a lot of the time you 
accidentally measure a bunch of heat from the environment, a bunch of your heat escapes. Um, and that's just because the tools are, I don't want to say cheap, but the good tools are crazy expensive. So in a high school chemistry setting, if you have a bad result, it might just be that you have junky equipment, but it could also be that you did something wrong. Um, so that's important to note. And when you're doing labs, especially like if your teacher tells you like this particular piece of equipment is really old or it's not calibrated properly, or we're going to like try to make this work, that could be why your results are kind of terrible. So that's something to report. You just know like, hey, my equipment was really old and warped and that's why we have horrible data. Scientists do that all the time most of science is getting it wrong and just understanding why it's wrong and then still looking to find the right answer. If we got the right answer the first time, every time, we wouldn't really need a lot of science. We would know all of the answers right away. Now, that measured value in that equation we've already spoken about, that is the value that you gather from the experiment. It's what you actually measure. All right, let's say we're doing a lab experiment and we try to determine, let's say, the density of aluminum. Um, the density of aluminum, and excuse me, I'm not like the greatest tablet writer. <laughs> the density of aluminum, I believe, um, is 2.7 grams per, we're going to say cubic centimeter because we're measuring a solid, aluminum is typically a solid. And let's say in that lab experiment, um, the student determined, we'll say that's you, you did the mass, you did the volume, you divided those two numbers, and you let's just add a zero here for the sake of significant figures. We'll say you got 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter. And you are questioning, wow, did I do this correctly? I didn't get the same number as all of the other scientists. So what did I, what did, what happened? What did I do? So we know that you are going to do the percent error equation to figure out kind of how far off you are. And that is going to be your measured value minus the accepted value that all the scientists agree on divided by the accepted value. And you at the end are going, this is the absolute value. At the end, you are going to multiply by 100. So the measured value is your uh, 2.65. And we can put the units in here. I usually don't like to put the units in. I think it clutters things up. Um, the accepted value from the scientists is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. And we're not just like trusting that number. Scientists have come up with this number over and over and over and over and over again for a very long time. That's why they call it the accepted value. And we are going to divide that by the accepted value of 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so the first thing that we are going to do is this subtraction on the top. So we are going to do the 2.65 minus the 2.7, and we're going to get negative 0 0.05. But because this is supposed to be in absolute value bars, we are just going to make that a positive value. So this is going to come out to 0 0.05, and the units subtract the units. So that's what we're left with, and we are going to divide that by the 2.70, which is the accepted value. And I can't do that math in my head, so I'm going to put that in a calculator. 0 0.05 divided by 2.70. With that, I am going to get 0 0.0185. And remember, I have to multiply that by 100 in order to turn it into a percent, which is the same thing as moving the decimal in twice. And with that, I am going to have as my final answer 1.85%. This means that the measurement that you got of 2.65 is an accurate result. We would consider that accurate because your percent error falls under the 5% rule. So that's how you use the equation. And that is how you are going to determine if your experimental results are considered accurate.
Make sure to leave any questions you have in the comment section below. Subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson and I'll see you there. Bye for now.